Women make up the bulk of the animal rights movement, animal welfare movement, animal law movement, and yet too few are in positions of power and not because they lack the capacity. People of color continually face microaggressions that remind them that they're just not welcome here. Recent media coverage has shined a bright light on the movement's underlying sexism and unfair treatment, problems that have been ignored for decades, uh, except by a very tiny minority, most of whom sitting to my right. Um, as with any problem that has been left unattended, this one has festered and is now oozing publicly for all to see. And so, I want to remind us that it is not enough to care just about the suffering of non-human animals. It never was. Uh, we have to extend our compassion and respect to all living beings, uh, including and especially the people we work with and the volunteers who work for our movement, um, as well as the people we wish to draw closer and even the people we disagree with and fight with all, sh all deserve respect. The people who engage in unfair treatment of others um, in our movement and elsewhere may not have the capacity to comprehend what they're doing. They may not be able to change their behavior. Um, and so it's up to us uh, to engage in a broad-based internal reflection, ask ourselves the hard questions and put in place systemic, systematic, and honest solutions. And to that end, we have for the last several years had a panel like this to try to prick the conscience and get us to think about these questions. And today we have, this year we have very, two very distinguished panelists that I'm honored to be here with. Carolyn Walker was recently recognized by the Multnomah County, um, Oregon Bar Association for her outstanding professionalism. She's a former partner with Stoll Reeves in Portland, where she practiced labor, uh, practiced labor and employment law. She represented clients and litigated on a wide variety of employment matters, including retaliation, wrongful discharge claims based on race, ethnic origin, gender, age, and religion. She worked on sexual and racial harassment, disability discrimination, breaches of employment contracts, and other claims arising out of the employment context. She has represented clients in jury trials, arbitrations, mediations, and before administrative agencies such as the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And she's now, in a few weeks, after a little bit of a time off. She's going to begin a new position as Assistant General Counsel for Portland General Electric in Portland, Oregon. I recommend that you read her submission titled Reflections of an African American Female Employment Attorney on Issues of Race and Gender within the Animal Protection Movement. You will find it in the conference materials and it's worth a read. Next to her is Patrice Jones, the co-founder of Vine Sanctuary an LGBTQ-run farmed animal sanctuary in dairy country that since 2000 has worked with an eco-feminist understanding of the intersection of oppressions. Vine has taken the lead in queering the animal liberation movement, organizing dozens of events and publications on the intersections between speciesism and homophobia. Vine also includes anti-racist efforts in its local campaigns while actively promoting a plant-based agricultural economy in dairy country. Not an easy place to do that. Patrice has been a social change activist dating back to the 1970s. I think maybe our backgrounds mirror one another's. When as a teen gay liberation activist, she helped develop strategies that are now widely used by campus LGBTQ organizations. She's worked with organizations focused on AIDS, housing, disability rights, and anti-racist education. 
and she's brought all of these experiences and knowledge with her to Vine. She offers her perspective to encourage the vegan and animal advocacy movements to do the same. She's authored two books, The Oxen at the Intersection, Lantern 2014, and Aftershock, Confronting Trauma in a Violent World. She's also authored numerous essays, blogs, and anthologies. And her submission for this conference, Only You Can Stop Men Who Hurt Women From Also Hurting Animals, and What's Wrong With Rights, are very much worth your consideration. I'm honored to have them here today. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Joyce. Um, speakers often say that it's an honor to be invited to speak, but I actually feel that way today, for real, for real. Um, uh, I have so much uh, sincere appreciation for ALDF and uh, for Joyce and others who have been involved with the ALDF for years now. And um, I can't go on and on about that, but I just want to say I, I sincerely feel, um, yeah. Carolyn and I have decided that we're going to take a more dialogic approach um, uh, to talking about the issues that we have to discuss today. And so I, we're going to go back and forth. And what I'm just doing right now is giving you the framework of what we're going to be covering so you can sort of slot it into your mind. Um, so at first, we'll, uh, Carolyn will have some preliminary comments. Uh, next, we'll be talking for about 20 minutes on workplace pragmatics. Uh, we really want to move this out of the realm of why do we need to do this and into the realm of what exactly do we need to do. Um, and then after that, we'll have another 20 minutes or so on the more subtle ways that the way you do the work can be inadvertently raced or gendered or send signals that maybe you're not meaning to send. Um, and then a few minutes of food for further thought and fingers crossed we intend to leave about 15 minutes for um, some discussion. Uh, and there may be times in the course of it where we'll invite ideas from you as well. Okay. Right. Thank you, Patrice. And in, in terms of uh, being honored to be here, I am. This is the third year for me, uh, third time's a charm, hopefully. And um, I think that, uh, you know, the last two years, I think the first year I spoke on this panel with, with Joyce, and then uh, last year with Jennifer Fearing and Lauren Ornelius. And uh, we did talk very, in, in very much detail about what the problem was, but not so much how to, you know, come to solution and giving practical tips on on things that you could do individually. And I think that that's what we're going to focus more on here today. So, with that, uh, Patricia, Patrice and I talked about some of the challenges that we've had when we've done either trainings or given presentations to people on issues of race and gender, and one of the things that we both found in common is that what uh, will often happen is that we will talk about the challenges, what the problems are. We'll talk about statistics that show that, you know, that women and people of color are um, disproportionately affected and, and treated less favorably, et cetera. And then what we get from that, uh, from some people, is, well, it seems to me that what you're saying is, Black people are better than white people, or um, it's an attack on men. And that is not what this is, okay? So one of the things that we want to convey at the very beginning here is please avoid the equity as oppression trap. It is not, okay? I, I, I've wondered why do some people see, um, hear these discussions of race and gender <clears throat> as an attack on white males rather than a plea or a demand for equity and equality. And what I've had to do, because I don't want to be tone deaf to the, to the message that I'm sending, is I've had to go back and I've had to look at the materials that I've submitted, the things that I've said when I've given speeches, and I've, I've gone back and I've done that, and I said, it's not me. I am not delivering that message, okay? <laughs> so what is it? 
And so in doing this kind of analysis and, and doing further research, um, what I have come to accept is what I've seen and, and, and read is a statement um, that, that many of you may have seen now. It's something that I, I think is you know, finding its way more into the conventional wisdom is that when you are a member of a privileged class or when you have always been a pl in a place of privilege, equity and equality begins to look and feel like oppression, right? And I see a lot of you nodding your heads. And so we want to make sure that there is an understanding here today that we start off with an agreement that what we are sharing here are ideas in our uh, discussions about being anti-racist and anti-sexist are not equated to being anti-white or anti-male. There's a difference, okay? Right, and so, um, Teresa, anything? Yeah, I, I would say, because we're sort of in the realm of the emotional reactions that, that people can have that can then make, make it difficult for them to hear um, the things that we're talking about. And, and I would say that in a, what I've noticed is that in addition to um, that, that feeling of oppression that those in a privileged position sometimes feel when asked to be quiet or, or take a step back. Um, uh, th th there's a, another more complicated feeling that can come up for those of us who are simultaneously um, advantaged and disadvantaged, um, which is actually true for us, probably maybe most people. But by, by, by advantaged and disadvantaged, I mean, so I'm white. I'm also lesbian. I was also born in the USA and enjoy all of the benefits of citizenship. I also have an invisible disability. And I could go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, each of us is in a particular place on the matrix of interconnected oppressions where we have some advantage in some areas and disadvantage in others. The more that you're tuned into your own disadvantage, the harder it can be emotionally to hear that you are privileged. Because you're tapped into the ways that you're not privileged. This, this is one of many things that make it really hard sometimes for white women um, to deal with race. Um, because they're being asked to not think about the ways that they're subordinated by the dominant culture, but by the ways that they're empowered. And if you feel very, very disempowered because of some things that have happened to you, it can be really hard to think about the ways that you do have power. So I would just ask everybody to understand, it's hard. Live with that hardness, sit with that hardness. You've done other hard things. Um, you can do this hard thing too. And the, um, one other thing that I want to get out here uh, preliminarily is this idea of um, being silent or silenced. And I want to encourage everybody to please do not be silent and do, and do not let yourself be silenced. Um, Joyce mentioned that I uh, was recently awarded the Professionalism Award from Multnomah uh, County. And when I gave my acceptance speech on that um, award, I got very, very positive feedback. And I, I felt very good about the speech. But someone who would come as my invited guest, who was a, a white male, um, 71 years old, and someone I considered a friend, many months later told me that he felt that my speech was um, an attack on on white people when all I did was, first of all, accept the award and talk about, <laughs> talk about how if we're really trying to achieve uh, professionalism as we, we claim we're trying to within the, within the bar, that one of the things that we need to do is to be inclusive. And part of being inclusive is ensuring that there's equity for women and people of color in terms of opportunities and in terms of earning potential and in terms of promotion. Uh, promotional opportunities, et cetera. And um, what I, when I said to him, did you read my speech? Because I can send it to you and nowhere in it is there any such information. And what he said is that there was an appropriate time and place for, to have those kinds of discussions. And my thought was, it's appropriate right now because I had, right then, because I had the microphone and I had something to say. And so, what I realized is this, this friend of mine, he, he enjoyed uh, you know, the things that I had to say when I wasn't saying things that made him uncomfortable. And what he wanted is for me to be silent on those things. 
And what he wanted is something that he would not get and he will never get. I will not be silent and I will not be silenced. And we've seen a lot of things in the, in the media uh, recently that have potentially had the effect on silencing many women and potentially people of color who have experienced inequities, violence, et cetera. And what I would say is, just because we've seen that treatment, just because there have been things that have um, discouraged us from speaking out, do not let that be the case. We need to continue to speak out and be very vocal about these things, even if it seems like it's all for naught. So um, with that, I want to go right into the topic of uh, equity and diversity and inclusion within the workplace. And within that context of the workplace, um, I'm talking about hiring, retention, wages, and empowerment, all of those issues. All right, so I'm going to take the lead on this, but Patrice will jump in whenever she wants to. <laughs> All right. Uh, so one of the things that I think is important to do to increase the participation of people of color and you know the growth of and promote the growth of women and people of color within the movement is to think about recruitment. And um, by a show of hands, can I see? Uh, for people who are in uh, organizations or companies who feel that there is a lack of uh, diversity in terms of race and ethnicity within their organizations. And for those individuals, um, do you know whether your organizations make active efforts to recruit in, in areas where they may not normally look? Do any of you know? Okay. I see that some of you say yes, and I recognize that, you know, <laughs> one hand that I see, I, I know what, you, you know, the kinds of efforts that you probably take, but I also saw some heads shaking, like, like maybe you don't know what efforts there are. And what I would say in this respect is to think about where you are going to look for your employees. You know, are you going to, for example, if you're looking to increase, you know, the, the number of uh, black people. Are you going to historically black colleges and universities and looking at those students and asking those students to come forward and participate? Um, where are you advertising? If you're advertising in your, um, you know, in your newspapers and um, job posting boards, are you also thinking about advertising in local papers that are geared towards people of color? Those are places and those are areas in which, you know, just making a little effort or thinking outside of the box can make a, a difference in you being able to increase your pool when you're considering recruiting people of color. Um, and then also think about the student groups that you're speaking to when you, when and if you do go to these colleges to recruit. You know, say you go to Georgetown to recruit. Well. At you, are, are you talking to the Black Student Union? Are you talking to the Asian Students Association? Are you talking to the Hispanic uh, Students Associations, et cetera? Those are places where you can make a difference and uh, you can potentially increase your pool. So please think about, uh, think about that. And um, what I would also like to do here is in, in giving you some of my ideas and Patrice sharing with you some of her ideas with this, let us know what some of you are doing, because as, you, as we share I, our ideas about what has worked for people, what hasn't worked, or efforts that, are, uh, that we're making, it, we can get a richer bank of the type of activities that you can engage in to increase that pool. So let's hear from some people about what kind of efforts that, yeah, that you make. Anyone? Yeah, we're
first step is recognizing the problem, and then the next step is like everybody's really busy and you're trying to do these things, and you know, you know, you just post your jobs in the usual places, you'll get plenty of applicants, and so it doesn't, you know, from top to bottom, really, it doesn't happen directly. So we're trying to make it more uh, to provide practical solutions, not just for, you know, um, people at the top level in the organization, but anybody who's hired in the organization. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And uh, could everybody hear what Steve said? And you mentioned a, a particular association within the Bay Area. I think you said creative diversity. It's critical diversity, critical diversity solutions. Critical diversity solutions, yeah. Um, in Portland, there is a group called Partners in Diversity. And I would be surprised if in many of the, you know, the jurisdictions where you all work that there weren't similar sorts of organizations that can help you figure out where you can go to sort of um, locate or um, source uh, uh, people of, of color um, so that you will have at least some sort of um, um, path to getting access to, um, to diverse candidates. And they can come up with suggestions of where you can, other places where you can post job listings, et cetera. And, um and, oh, and I just wanted to say, so Critical Diversity Solutions is run by Breeze Harper, um, who runs the Sister Vegan Project, edited the Sister Vegan Anthology. And even though they're located in the Bay Area, she does consulting all over the country. Um, so if you're an organization of enough size to actually hire a consultant, um, that would be a place to reach out. Breeze is also somebody who um, is frequently willing, as are many prominent people of color within the movement, to share job listings. Um, with her community. Um, and so one thing that we've done, remembering that you know, affirmative action as it's been enacted um, is, is a point of hot contention for many people, so much so that people forget what the whole point of using that phrase was, which is that um, if we wanna do, if we, racism and other biases, they won't go away on their own. We have to take affirmative steps. And so if you want a more diverse pool of applicants, you're going to have to take affirmative steps to do that. Proactive. Um, yeah, yeah, proactive is a good way to put it. And so um, uh, one thing that we do in addition to the, the things that Carolyn mentioned um, is don't forget social media. Because at this point you know, on social media, there are numerous um, organizations of vegan people of color, um, et cetera, uh, 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 people with uh, uh, LGBTQ vegan groups. Um, there are all sorts of you know, uh, organizations uh, on social media where you can share your job postings with them and they'll perhaps share it with their network and you might end up with a more diverse pool of applicants. However, I would caution, and then leading into what you're going to say next, uh, folks are only going to be willing to do that for you if they know that yours is a safe place to work, right? Um, and so that actually leads yeah. back into um, yeah, the so things that Carolyn was yeah, going to cover. There, and you know, in, in terms of it being a, a safe place to work, there is a, a, a piece of this that comes, to, comes down to establishing trust with uh, people of color, communities of color, because there's sometimes there's a, a suspicion um, within communities of color when we are we are hearing that you know, uh, you know this is a very important that we protect the rights of animals that we are you know front line supporting anim animals and preventing cruelty to animals. We want to make sure um, with, within communities of color that there's that same kind of outcry, that same kind of passion when it comes to protecting the rights and the lives of people and people of color. And sometimes that has been ignored. Now that is not to say that people of color are not interested in animal protection and animal rights because it, that is, it seems to be a bit of a, uh, a prevailing attitude and it is a fallacy. And what I can say about that is that people really need to watch their assumptions about who is and who is not interested in this movement, in, in animal rights and animal protection, right? 
Um, I, I wasn't going to talk about this. I think I may have mentioned it a couple years ago, but Patrice thought it was important that I mention. When I'm walking downtown, and I will say that this, ha this has not happened in the last year, and it may be because I'm not walking downtown as much as I used to <laughs> in Portland, I would, see, uh, I would see leaf litters. I would see people you know, standing on the corner um, you know, that, talking about animal rights, animal protection, maybe wanting to, to get people to sign um, a, a petition, et cetera. And I would get ignored. I would see them approach, you know, I would see them approach white men and women, and then they would see me and just kind of turn away. Same with environmentalists, you know, because maybe there was an assumption that I'm not interested in the environment or I'm not interested in animal protection. And I've got to say that is the wrong assumption to make. The other piece of it is, it may be that um, a, a certain group has, or a certain person has not expressed an interest in animal rights or animal protection, but just by approaching that person and talking about that issue, you may find that that person becomes interested. You have piqued their interest. You have provided them with some information. And I, I would say that goes back to even starting going to schools and HBCUs and the the students of color organizations and talking to them about these issues. Because even if it's something that wasn't in their mind, it doesn't mean that it's not in their hearts and in their spirit. So, you know, this is taking it back to a, a, a level a little bit beyond, um, you know, just a professional approach. This is taking it uh, back to a level of think about what you can do to create this interest um, and to develop an interest that already exists. And I would say that when, 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 why I wanted you to tell the, the story is because, so there's two things here. One is that, so it's the opposite of the assumptions. So what survey research, what little research there is tells us is that women of color are more likely than any other group uh, to be open to animal rights. Um, and we also know that the incidence of veganism in, in the African American community is about twice the percentage of uh, incidence of veganism uh, among white people. Um, and so if you're doing vegan outreach or animal rights outreach, like the last person you want to not hand a leaflet to um, is Carolyn. Um, and, and so, but what's this about, right? I think it is about these presumptions about who's going to be interested or not. But I also know that a lot of white people are really uncomfortable talking to black people. Um, and that might be another piece. Yeah. Um, and that's something that if that's you, you're gonna have to interrogate in yourself and do some work and do some educating because if that's the case, then you're also going to be uncomfortable in the job interview. Um, and you're also going to be subtly communicating your discomfort to coworkers. Yeah. Um, and perhaps inadvertently straying into the realm of microaggressions, and so yeah. I think that gets us back onto the Yeah, track. yeah, and, at be, and before we actually go um, right into the, this issue of microaggressions, I want to talk about in hiring, right. um, and the, um, when, you are, when you are hiring, think about what you're hiring for, okay? Um, and do not hire for what you would, what I would call fit within your organization. Hire to fill the gaps in your organization. If you know you have a gap, in uh, being able to have outreach to communities of color or a certain segment of the population or a certain group of donors, what you're going to be doing is hiring to fill that gap. And let's say your intent, Steve, is to increase the uh, diversity within your organization. Would you hire someone who does not necessarily have um, ties with communities of color or uh, other communities with, that you're trying to develop some sort of relationship with. And when you're trying to hire other people that would be comfortable within the organization. Right, so think about that. Hire to fill the gaps, hire to fill the needs of your organization as opposed to someone who fits right in. Because if you just hire someone who fits right in, guess what? They're going to continue to be, you know, white, and at the top, it's going to continue to be male-dominated, right? So hire for the gaps. Um, in retention, one of the things that we need to really think about is some behaviors can drive people away from your organization. 
when people don't feel comfortable, when they don't feel like they are welcomed in the organization, when they're not asked to participate in the same kinds of um, efforts that others that are, are asked to participate in. So let me give an example. For me, within my law firm, and this is not to disparage my former law firm, because I think this is common uh, for a number of organizations and companies, I was asked all the time to sit on the diversity committee, you know, always. But never was I invited to sit on another committee that had, you know, power within the firm, within the organization. And that's what uh, those kinds of things, they start to build resentment and uh, within people of color. That's not to say that if you hire someone uh, within your organization that is a person of color, and they express an interest in increasing equity, diversity, and inclusion within your organization that you say, well, no, Carolyn said that. I shouldn't ask you to be on the committee. No, what you do is you let people you know, go where their interests are, but don't make an assumption that this person is, you know, is the right person for that as opposed to you know, something else, some, you know, doing development so that they you know, can go out and raise donor dollars, et cetera. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and then I also want to talk about this issue of uh, microaggressions because a lot of that, um, a lot of microaggressions come from not just our assumptions about people, but these implicit biases that Patrice mentioned earlier. And I want to give an example of something that I consider um, to be a microaggression. And everybody now kind of understands what this issue of microaggression, right? We've seen it, we've heard about it enough so that we kind of get what it means. Um, but specific examples for me include um, coming up to a, a person of color and only talking to them about things that you think a person of color would be interested in, um, or being dismissive of a woman in a meeting who, who makes a statement in a meeting and you say something like, well, we've already tried that and it doesn't work. You know, those kinds of things, whereas if a, if a man had made the same statement, it, there might have been some more consideration that is given to it. So think about these little subtle actions that you take um, or that you engage in or that you observe others engaging in that, that work to sort of either shut someone down or over time make them feel uncomfortable to the point where they don't want to be a part of your organization anymore. Does anybody else have an example of what they would consider microaggressions? Anything that's happened to you in your workplace? Not being invited to outside events, like, you know, or being, or things like that. You know, if the organization is going to some kind of fundraiser or golfing or whatever it is, not being invited to that. Yeah, yeah, that's one. Anybody else? Yes. I've been in a situation where it's a group setting where I've done most of the work and yet had not been conversed with about what that work entailed and had other male members of the group kind of be asked to explain. Yeah, the work that you did, someone else is getting uh, credit for that, right? That's a big one. Uh, one thing that'll happen a lot in meetings is. Um, a, a, a woman will speak up and say some idea and nobody reacts and about five minutes later a man will say the exact same idea and then everybody's like, whoa, great idea! And then it starts being talked about as John's idea and then they do the initiative and, and it's John's baby. Yeah, um, yeah. That's, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one and a bad one. And I think that it's, I can tell from the, the laughter that I'm hearing in the room that we've seen it and we've, we've all heard it and experienced either directed at us or someone else. So let me just see by a show of hands um, how, how many of you have experienced being ignored. Okay, oh, wow. <laughs> all right. Um, what about um, being interrupted when you're in a meeting? Yeah. Yeah, um, and then of course the one that Patrice just mentioned, that, that big one, you know, the man's, man comes behind a, a woman and makes a, a statement and it's, you know, it's celebrated as, you know, the second coming. Well, there are things that we can do about that. Um, I'm going to give you some practical mm -hmm. solutions to, to that. Mm -hmm. And some of you may have your own approaches to dealing with that. But I've started doing it for my, for my own protection in meetings and what it means for me is not just standing up for myself, because sometimes that can be a little bit tough for mm -hmm. people that 
are not used to standing up for themselves. But we're, we're going to talk about this, what I call bystander intervention, right? And this is something that the EEOC has certainly been encouraging in the last few years with respect to sexual harassment, where the, the bystander, someone who observes something that is inappropriate in the workplace, speaks up on behalf of the person who has been uh, either uh, subjected to the inappropriate comment or the inappropriate action. And that's a really great approach to take. And I think it's very effective in the context of helping to prevent sexual harassment. But I think in the broader workplace context, as we are talking about with respect to these meetings and what happens in meetings, we can engage in bystander intervention. So for example, if someone ignores what a, a, a person has, has said, or has not given that person a chance to talk, and everybody else in the meeting has um, had a chance to talk, and often these meetings will be male-dominated. You, as a person who is observing this, and this goes for men included, you can say, um, you know, I think Jane had something to say, and I'd like to hear from her. Just a simple statement like that. Or if Jane got interrupted, what you could say is this. when. Jane is, Jane is talking and uh, John jumps in and interrupts her, you can say, excuse me, John, I think that Jane had not yet finished the thought that she was, that she was sharing with us and I'd like to hear her finish her thought. Simple as that, right? And then this other one, this big one that just, it's, it's, it <laughs> burns us up to hear it. When Jane has given her statement or Jane has made a statement or given an idea and then John comes in a couple minutes later and, and uh, makes the same statement and gets credit for it, you can say something like this. You know, I agree with the statement that John just made where he was reiterating the, <laughs> <laughs> the, original, the original thought that Jane expressed. And I think it's a good idea what, uh, and we should go with what Jane, has, what Jane has said. So you acknowledge, John just took credit for it, mm -hmm. but Jane had the original thought, okay? So are there any uh, other kinds of uh, tips that you all might have for approaches that you've taken in those situations or thoughts that you think, yeah? Yeah. Did all of you hear that and see that? The managing partner would just say, <laughs> was like a talk to the hand kind of thing. <laughs> or listen to the hand because I've still got something to say. That is an approach, but that's an approach where she was certainly assertive enough to go ahead and take that kind of standing up for herself. But not everyone is able to do that. So think about what you can do as a bystander to help people. And you know, they did this in the Obama White House. Did any of you hear about that? That in the Obama, in the Obama White House, many women were feeling like they weren't being heard within meetings. And so they started taking this approach where they would stick up for each other in meetings. And they would say, oh, what Jane just said was a really good idea. And they would just kind of reinforce what they heard from each other. And it was called amplification. All right, so what we need to do is amplify the voices of women and other people that have been either marginalized or ignored or interrupted, et cetera, and it is a very effective approach. I saw some other hands here about ideas. Front row. That is a fantastic idea. Did, Did everybody, everybody hear, hear that, that one? Yeah, you're basically setting the ground rules of engagement at the beginning of the meeting, where you, you come up with a statement or you, you say, these are the things that we agree to. We will not interrupt each other. We will give credit where credit was, is due, and we will listen to each other, that kind of thing. That is a wonderful approach to start every meeting, and I'd never thought of that. So um, now you all have the benefit of what this, organization, this person in her organization does.
Excellent. Yeah, and that's really, it's really important for, for those who, um, for, uh, for whatever reason, like have more power in the meeting, like it's really important to be mindful of your own contributions, of moderating your own contributions, of actually kind of keeping track of who has spoken and who hasn't spoken, and using your power to sort of give your power away. And it can be hard. Like, I like to talk in meetings. So, I mean, if it's a meeting where you have to raise hands, you might have to literally sit on your hands to keep yourself quiet. I also do this. <laughs> But um, y'all wanted practical tips, I'm telling you. For the guys in the room or those who are coded masculine, I'm often accorded the power that men have just because of how I look sometimes. Um, so I have to be mindful myself. Um, you, you, um, sit, literally sit on your hands. Put your hand over your mouth and listen. And you know what, that, that reminds me, Patrice, of something that you and I had discussed because when we were talking about this issue, going back to not being silent or silenced, one of the things that Patrice said <laughs> that I thought was actually kind of funny but also um, very interesting and helpful is know when to be quiet mm -hmm. and when you need to. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Um. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> Just in situations as we've talked about where you notice you've 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 con noticed that you've contributed a lot. Okay, time for me to be quiet, even if I have twelve other really good ideas in my head. Too bad, be quiet now. Um, and um, uh, but also there are times when it's not your. Um, well, we've all heard about mansplaining, right? Um, so, but this can happen for there's white splaining and every kind of splaining you can can imagine. I mean, there are times when you don't have the standing. Um, uh, sometimes you don't have the standing to say anything at all. Other times, yeah, you can, but you're not you're not like others have more standing than you to speak on this, and so you need to listen and learn. Um, and, 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 and not be like, and I don't mean just sit there waiting to say the thing that you want to say. I mean actually setting aside whatever it was you thought you wanted to say in order to listen to the folks who actually have more standing than you to talk about this and learn something from them. And again, that takes some mental discipline sometimes, um, particularly if you're used to being able to pontificate at length. Yeah, and thank you, Patrice. And the last thing that I want to say about this, this issue of um, workplace, um, yeah, because we're we are moving ahead, like this is not nearly enough time to talk about all of these issues. But just really quickly, Friday evening, um, I, I got to town on Thursday and I went to a lecture in Evanston by Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Has anybody heard of him? Okay, well, you may want to read his book. He challenged my ideas on how to shift racist paradigm that, in, that exists in this country. Because one of the things that he said is, rather than trying to focus on changing people's hearts and minds about issues of race, um, really what we need to do is change policies because racist policies are what begets racist ideas. And I thought about that, and I think there may be something to that. And so, you know, on a, on a macro level, we know the kinds of things that we need to do. We need to you know, write to our legislators and run for office and do that kind of thing. But on a macro level, let's talk about what you can do within your organizations uh, to change policies, if not the laws, or at least to ensure that your policies are encompassing so that uh, people of, uh, that, that women and, and people of color feel like they're being treated fairly. If you have a strategic plan, and I'm presuming that all of your organizations and companies do have a strategic plan, and if they don't, they should, um, within that strategic plan, ensure that these issues and these ideas of um, inclusion and equity are woven into the fabric of your strategic plan. And by that, I mean not, you know, be, oh, it's just a separate goal with everything that you do within you know, the, the decisions that you make within the company, it should be viewed through this um, equity lens so that no decisions with respect to hiring, no decisions with respect to fundraising, no, no decisions with respect to anything else within your company is done without considering things through an equity lens. No messaging, 
no advertising, et cetera, is done without considering things through a lens of equity. Okay? And um, I think with that, we should probably move on to the next topic and, uh, on how you do the work. Okay, but the things that were, so we're, 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 we're skipping things now because we went longer than yeah. we meant and we had, so we're gonna do the discussion a little bit later. And also, I don't wanna, uh, Carolyn was going to talk about wages yeah. and it just don't, don't forget wage equity uh, when, when you're thinking about all of this and also don't forget that even if you have wage equity within your organization, if the wages in your organization are lower um, than the norm, that's going to price out people from economically disadvantaged backgrounds who may not be able to work for less. Yeah. Um, so think about all of, yeah, all thanks of that. Yeah, thanks for coming back to that, Patricia. And I just real quickly, I want to remind people about the impact of um, uh, wage inequities. Because remember this, keep in mind that unless you stand up, unless you say something, unless you demand that your companies, your organizations do something like a salary survey to ensure that there is parity uh, within wages, women and people of co color are going to continue to be generationally disadvantaged. Think about the fact that on average a uh, woman, a white woman, will earn about half a million dollars less over her lifetime than her white male counterpart. Women of color, black women in particular, uh, over a million dollars less than their white male counterparts, and those numbers get worse as we go higher within you know, managerial levels, right? Okay. So speak up, do not be silent, ask, demand for parity and equity on, on the, in these areas. Great, and, and I'm so glad that Carolyn just mentioned um, that this isn't just about the particular person you're paying, like everything's connected to everything else, so your pay inequity can contribute to generational inequality. Like it's really important to keep that bigger picture um, in mind, and that is what we're supposed to, the next big chunk of what we're talking about, which is the more subtle ways that how you do the work, anything from your messaging to the, your treatment of your clients, um, uh, maybe inadvertently gendered race or, or sending signals. Um, and I just want to say, to lead off, um, since Carolyn talked about some of her personal experiences, I want to say some of my personal experiences with lawyers. Um, <coughs> Those wonderful people. Um, who I do think of as wonderful people. Who I do think of as caretakers. Um, when I was doing AIDS work, I was arrested for giving out condoms in front of a um, high school because the schools weren't doing the jobs that they should do. And two feminist lawyers um, took care of me. Um, we did this whole trial. And what I wanted was not just the First Amendment issue, which we would totally win on, but to do a necessity defense so that we could enter um, evidence um, and they figured out how to do an offer of proof so that we could actually, even if we ended up winning summarily, we'd still get it into the newspaper. And it was just, it was beautiful. I felt cared for the entire way through. I don't know how many times as a tenant organizer, um, I called on people working at Legal Aid to, to work with, to help us with um, a rent strike or whatever the case might be. I don't know how many times I've written the name of a lawyer on my arm um, before a demonstration, um, knowing that they would be there for me. Um, and now um, in the animal movement, several of my friends are folks who have been prosecuted and in some cases imprisoned um, for their animal rights work and, um, or their animal liberation work and the lawyers have been there for them. So I don't think of lawyers in that sort of stereotypical way. I think of lawyers as caretakers. Um, and I'd like you to think of lawyers as caretakers too because I think that could shift the paradigm here um, because um, uh, for in ways that I think will be clear. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna come back to caretakers. I'm ta sorry, talking really fast now to get everything out. So, so the thing that, one thing that I want to, just as a very simple example, is so lawyers have really been helping my friends who have been imprisoned, but my friends who have been imprisoned, like me, tend to be prison abolitionists now. 
um, tend to be talking um, about the um, inherent violence of the criminal justice system, tend to be talking about restorative justice rather than, than prison. Um, and yet, I see animal rights organizations, including legal animal rights organizations, doing excited social media posts because this person got um, convicted and sentenced for animal cruelty and he's going to prison. Um, and so I would really like the um, folks who are involved in this to think about that lock them up approach to animal abuse and whether that actually is, I understand that it fits with the whole project of, 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 of um, uh, having non-human animals be persons whose violation would be treated in the same way that violations of persons would be treated. But those of us who are working on the issue of violations of persons are actually shifting away from that lock em up approach. And when, I don't know how many people have seen 13th, you understand? <laughs> All right, so, so, so what are you saying to prospective people who want, might want to work for your organization or support your organization um, when you're posting photos of workers at a slaughterhouse um, who got convicted, oh, and they just happen to be men of color, um, and with this celebratory, um, uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. So, 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 so I would love to see ALDF or some other organization really take the lead in thinking through what does restorative justice look like for animals? How could we, how could we do the same thing without having that lock them up approach that implicitly supports the prison industrial complex? Um, uh, yay. Um, um, also, folks who have been involved in prison work also have been thinking about captivity more broadly and animals. So I would recommend a book that I forgot to put on our reading list. Can you hold that up? So we have a list of recommended further readings. Um, I only made 50 copies because Liberty uploaded it. Um, so you can access it through the conference website as well. One book that's not on there is Captivity, ed edited by Lori Gruen, where you have animal advocates and prison abolitionists contributing essays. Um, Another way you can inadvertently send uh, signals or, oh, hey, hey, hey. oh no, we're okay. We're, we're okay. Yeah. Um, is uh, through the use of inappropriate metaphors. Mm -hmm. um, and I know Carolyn had something to say about that. Yeah, yeah and it's something that I've talked about before um, when you're, you're talking about uh, comparing the treatment of animals to, you know, you know, rape of women, um, slave, uh, the enslavement of people of color in this country. Be very careful about that kind of messaging, because, and I've mentioned this before, it is not only offensive to the people that you, you know, that you use those metaphors for, like, uh, particularly with respect to black people in this country, to see uh, slavery compared to, you know, treatment of animals. Um, it is not effective it, because the fact is that treatment of anim mistreatment of animals is wrong in and of itself. You do not need that offensive and ineffective metaphor in order to get your message across. Same with respect to you know, rape of women. You do not need that offensive and upsetting uh, example to get your point across that treatment, mistreatment of animals is wrong in and of itself. And I would say also the, 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 the clumsy use of, wor of words or metaphors um, can have the inadvertent effect of not only um, alienated, alienating the exact people you were actually hoping to reach, um, but it can also accidentally um, flatten um, what you're saying about the experiences of animals and therefore work against um, empathy for animals. So for example, I'm a feminist. We're a feminist organization that cares for survivors of dairying. Um, and we talk considerably about the sexual violation of cows in the process of dairying. Um, uh, you don't have to keep, we have a clutch. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, we don't use the word rape. And we don't use the word rape for several reasons. One, because I've done work 
um, on rape and domestic violence. And I know that even within the community of people who work on sexual assault, that word is a hot button word. People don't all agree when it should be used and when it shouldn't be used. It's a hot flag for survivors. Uh, there are just so many ways you, 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 you go wrong when you use that word in any context. Um, um, but the other thing is that I'm actually interested in the experiences of cows. And as someone who's done a lot of work on sexual violence among people, I understand, for example, the experience of date rape is really different than the experience of, of stranger rape um, uh, for various reasons. There's a level of betrayal involved, right? When it's a family member or a friend who violates you as opposed to a stranger. Um, and that's part of our experiences of sexual assault. Well, the experience for a cow who's being sexually violated is neither of those two things. It's her own experience. And if we try to metaphor it over to our experience because we think we're gonna help people feel more empathy, what we might actually be doing is, is flattening her experience and, and not inviting people to have empathy for her particular experience. Does that make sense? Um, uh, so bring, empathy then brings us to the ethos of care, which is the most important thing I'm going to talk about. Um, another book that I didn't list was Carol Gilligan's In a Different Voice, which is a sort of classic about the different tendencies in moral reasoning between men and women, boys and girls. Um, and uh, I don't have time to go into it deeply, but her research, this was a long time, decades ago now. Um, men and women, um, not for any biological reason, but due to socialization, tend to engage in moral reasoning um, differently. And this doesn't mean that all men do it one way and all just tend. Um, and uh, so what she found in her research was that girls and women tended to do moral reasoning using an ethos of care, whereas boys and men tended to use an ethos of justice. Um, you can end up with the same answer to a moral dilemma using either one. If your moral dilemma is should the man, uh, can the, is the man allowed to steal medicine for his dying wife, you can reason your way to a yes using either the moral, the ethos of care or the ethos of justice. Um, justice is about right and wrong. It's about conformity to abstract principles. Um, care is about what actually happens to uh, the beings involved in the situation. Yeah? Um, so neither is right or wrong, um, but uh, a, a justice approach as opposed to a care approach does tend to vibe masculine. Um, yeah, because of that, that association. And so if, you're, if your rhetoric is, um, is um, avenging a wrong as opposed to taking care of a victim, that's going to vibe gendered whether we like it or not. That's gonna, so I'm just asking you to be aware of these vibes that you may be giving off. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and the ethos of justice, I have one more and then. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the ethos of justice can also sometimes lead people to not pay attention to the actual consequences and that can be um, bad. Yeah. So Patrice, what I wanted to know is what is that, it, when it vibes masculine, what is the manifestation of that? When it, what is the, the detrimental effect of that when it, can, when it vibes masculine? Um, it can make the organization seem less welcoming to women. It can also, as a, uh, also the ethos of justice can sometimes lead us to um, um, not pay attention to the actual um, ramifications of what we've done. But the more important thing that feminists have, have contraposed with the ethics of care is the heroic ethic. Um, and the heroic ethic in animal advocacy, which Marty Keel wrote an essay about, you can Google it and find the PDF online. Just Google Marty Keel, K-H-E-E-L, uh, heroic ethic, and you'll find the PDF. Helps to explain the Me Too movement here. It helps to explain this question of why do we have a, 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 a female-dominated movement where men have risen to the top, handsy men, um, have risen to the top. Um, 
Men who are serial rapists have been hired again and again and again in organizations. Men known to engage in dating violence um, get up on stage and are adulated as heroes. The heroic ethic says that we are saving the animals. We are the knight in shining armor who is saving the damsel in distress. And, and you can see it in environmental work when we're saving the planet as if the planet weren't far more powerful than we are. Um, or, or, or we think of ourselves as um, uh, uh, saving animals. Where we'll see this in animal advocacy is showboating, making, um, uh, not consulting animals, treating, like we're their savior so we know what's best for them rather than thinking really deeply and carefully about what they want. I'm, I'm assuming that's something that maybe came up in your ethics of animal advocacy yesterday. Um, using animals as tools, even when you're calling yourself an animal advocate, but you're actually just using them as a tool to make your point without regard to what effect that's going to have on them. Um, and so what we argue for is that we should see ourselves as allies of animals rather than the rescuers of animals. Um, you also want to watch out for the heroic ethic when we're talking about diversity and equity. Um, there's something called the white savior syndrome um, uh, or, 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 or the Prince Charming syndrome. You don't want to make a show of yourself um, doing the work. Just do the work. Um, and I think that's right. And uh, doing the work. In taking some of the approaches that we discussed today, I think will help you avoid that kind of heroic ethos that Patrice was talking about. So with that, we have I think 10 that, more minutes. Yeah, that we should um, maybe talk about, um, what, do people have questions yeah. that you'd like to pose to, to us? Up. And maybe the, the, use the mics? Yes. When, yes. Yeah, when you come and, up to ask questions. And as people are making their way to the mics, I'll just remind us there's a reading list there, and included in that reading list is critical race theory books. Um, I, I think that um, it, it's a critical race theory in legal thinking is um, super important. Um, and I think that you will find that educating yourself about that school of thought within legal thinking will not only make it easier to work on diversity inclusion issues in your organizations, but will actually give you really interesting ideas about animal liberation. One other book that, um, that is not on our list there, but I'd like to add to our list um, is, <laughs> we should uh, get updated yeah, I know. Um, it's Strapped from the Beginning. It's the Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, and that is mm -hmm. by Dr. Ibram X. Kendi that I just mentioned I, that I saw his lecture on Friday night. So um, with that, we really do encourage you to ask questions. And if you don't want to come up to the mic, you don't have to, all right? If you've got a question, just throw it out there, and we'll repeat it so that everybody can hear it. Oh, that's good. I'm going to assume that this conversation has raised a lot of questions. I have, I have several. So. <laughs> Please do come up. Let's use our time together. We've got one question here. And, and oh, and there's somebody at the mic there. Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you both so much. I feel like I gained an incredible amount of information that I can move forward with. Um, I find that heteronormative practices in organizations, particularly law firms, don't create a safe environment for LGBTQ individuals. Um, could you speak to how to maneuver your sexual orientation in a CIS dominant organization, particularly as it pertains to making yourself known? Right. Well, uh, for me at a, a law firm, one of the things that I found very helpful was becoming a part of, um, I will call it an affinity group for lack of a better term. And with that, uh, and it was with, you know, lawyers of color within my law firm. And with that, we could meet and we could talk about issues and we, if, if we came up with ideas and we could take them to management and we came from more of a position of power because there was more than one of us. Now that doesn't address the challenge if there's just one or two of you. That makes it more difficult. So what I would also say is within the, um, the you know, your legal community as a whole, 
if you are a member of an, you know, an organization, uh, you know, like an LGBTQ organization within your legal community, talk to them about some ideas that they have um, for helping you navigate in the law firm. And the other thing is, um, don't be afraid to start the group yourself. Um, and you may determine that you, you know, there, there aren't necessarily others that are part of, you know, your LGBTQ community, and you may decide that you would allow others in there, people who you think are, um, are advocates and allies of yours, because then you still have numbers. You still have you know, a, a greater mass than if it's just one or two people. Okay. Thank you. Um, someone over here had a question. We have somebody at the mic over and then here. let's. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to thank you, first of all. That was a really good uh, dialogue that just happened, but also, I wanted to know what your thoughts on uh, this idea that animals can be activists themselves, that like we don't necessarily have to speak for them, but that they can have their own voice. I just want to know. They do have their own voice. If you live at a sanctuary, you know this. Um, <laughs> it's so loud. <laughs> Every single moment. You heard when you, we were on the phone. You, you, there's the crowing and the mooing and the buying. And so a big piece of it is just to remember um, that, um, that animals have their own voices. Um, uh, there's a quote by uh, Arundhati Roy, the novelist and essayist, um, where she says, there's no such thing as the voiceless, there's only the selectively unheard. Um, <laughs> so if you've ever called yourself the voice of the voiceless, stop immediately, um, because animals are not voiceless. Um, they have voices, and so, and if we think of ourselves as their voices, we, we will forget to listen to them. Animals are also always actively seeking their own liberation. Um, and again, you can look to sanctuaries for stories of this. At, at, at Vine, uh, there's, a, there's a, a cow, Jan, who came to us via farm sanctuary. Jan jumped a beef farm fence while pregnant um, in order to make sure that this next calf would not be taken from her. Gave birth in the safety of the forest, found her way to a safe place, and then because she would knock you down if you even looked at him, was not a good match for Farm Sanctuary with all their tours, um, and came to Vine um, to live in our back pastures. But, but animals are always seeking their own liberation. If you can always be remindful of that, you'll be less likely to slip into the heroic eff ethic. Yeah, and just to f further on, on your question uh, to Patrice, I heard Patrice saying to me over and over again, you know, we should be listening to the animals. And I didn't really understand what she meant until I, you know, I talked to her more and also read some of her materials, which are included in the materials that are online for this presentation. So I encourage you to read those and you'll hear more about that. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, I know we're short on time, but this might be a long question. Um, I was just curious if you could speak more to the hero ethic and not from the perspective of what we shouldn't do to allow it to happen, but how do we deal with the fact that it's so entrenched already and kind of deconstructing it? <laughs> um, that's really hard. And, you know, I've thought about this a lot. And, you know, we can't ignore the whole Kavanaugh situation um, because the heroic ethic in animal ethics persists not only because we feel ourselves to be heroes, or some of us do, but because people are applauding the heroes, right? They stop being the heroes when people stop looking at them with shining eyes and calling them angels and heroes, right? Um, and so unfortunately, in animal advocacy, as in the wider world, what we have seen is a pattern of white women applauding and um, propping up problematic white men and seeing them as angelic heroes. And look, if I knew the answer to that, <laughs> we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now. All I can say is try to not be a hero yourself, try to show solidarity to other people, and try to knock the heroes down a peg whenever you can. <laughs> Um, so I'm an employer, um, and I hope <laughs> that I do a very good job of, of hiring people from more marginalized communities. Um, 
And something that I have noticed more than once over the years is that I will have an employee um, from a marginalized community who I want to support um, and who will be seeming to engage in um, behavior that is biased against particular other employees or particular other clients who come from other marginalized gr groups. Um, and for me, I want very much to figure out a way to, to appropriately support them and get them past that. Um, I think it's coming from some trauma in past work experiences. And, and it's, you know, I don't want to be an armchair psychologist, but I want to know an appropriate way for me to provide resources to somebody who is having a difficult time um, and make sure they can succeed. Okay, so I think we're out of time, but very quickly, what I would suggest in, in that situation is that you've got work rules that are in place, right? Enforce your work rules. And it's one thing to, you know, to, to be caring and try to, to take care of this person and, and try to you know, dive into their psyche as to why they're doing these things. But first and foremost, if they're violating your work rules, your standards of behavior, if they're engaging in something that is discriminatory, and certainly that person from the marginalized group can be a discriminator, stop it. You've got to say, oh, we these, do stop that. These are, our, yeah. the, these are our work rules. And then is it your place to then like, go beyond that? I think what you can do is say, you know, this is the training that we offer on those kinds of things. Um, but what you, what you can't allow is for this person to proceed or to give them a pass because they're a member of a marginalized group. And the other thing that I would say is be very careful of othering this person and being concerned like, I want to you know, treat this person with kid gloves because this person is a member of a marginalized group. That's othering. So you want to hold that person to the same standards and perhaps you can offer training. You can offer, you know, like what can we you know, think about if we have an EAP program to help you, you know, go through some of these, deal with some of these issues, but it's not your job to, to fix that person. As, as an employer, your job is to ensure that they're following your work rules. So that's what I would focus on more. Yeah, yeah, that's my real area of concern is, is that I don't, I don't want to lose people, but we always have to put this stop to it. But I have a place of compassion for what they may be going through. So it's like, you know, how can we both put a stop to it, which we do. Um, but also not lose that person potentially. Okay, some people you may need to lose, all right? So, um, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. I, that, I would think about that as well. And we can take this offline and discuss it because I have yeah. some ideas that I can um, share. One more thing that I forgot to say, and I'll just hate myself if I don't say it. You know, we've been talking about <clears throat> making organizations more inclusive, et cetera, et cetera. But another big thing to do is support other organizations. Like, some people of color are going to want to work in people of color organizations. Some LGBTQ people are not going to want to integrate your mostly straight organization. They're going to want to work in an LGBTQ organization. And so, so while we want to make existing organizations fair workplaces and, and um, et cetera, we also um, have to make sure we're doing what we can structurally within the movement to start new organizations that arise. So if there is a new legal organization of lawyers of color who say, from our angle, we can see a different way to do this work and we just want to start our own group to do that, um, or queer lawyers who want to start uh, an animal law organization, the, the longer standing and better resourced organizations need to find ways to get them work, uh, get them resources, um, uh, if that makes sense? Yes. Yeah, so that's another important thing to do. I want to thank the two of you. This was absolutely extraordinary, 75 minutes. And, and we'll be at the back for a few minutes um, uh, or in, in out in the hall if people want to ask yes. us questions. Just They'll to... be available for questions. We have, at this point, a 10-minute break, and then we will be dividing into two simultaneous sessions. Thank you very much. <laughs>